I think there's no better person to bring on here today to speak about what we're seeing actually play out in Iran. And as Mariam said, it's almost this collective fervor now we're seeing across the world. And I think Mariam and I can go into it as, as well about what's happening in London because Mariam was at a protest yesterday. And I think I want to unpack all of that with you as well. But just if you want to touch on Mariam, how, I mean, we are feeling this. I see, I see. Turkish women come out, I see Pakistani women come out, I see women from Afghanistan come out and say, we stand with our Iranian sisters. This seems to be like a watershed moment in Iran on the back of the tragedy we've seen of Masa Aminu, who was honestly, she was about to celebrate her 23rd birthday, I think two days ago. And this has just caused spread like wildfire across Iran. So yeah, Mariam, if you just want to kind of give us a backdrop and, and get into it. Yeah, um, thank you, Nuria, for that introduction. And also, it's great to see um, that you're inspiring, uh, both you and Harris are, are also inspiring people to be active and to take a stand. So uh, I'm grateful for that as well. Um, with regards to Iran, I think, um, as you say, really, the situation there is something that the whole world is watching. Uh, it is a watershed moment. It's very different than previous protests. And I think um, that is why it has uh, brought people's attention to what's happening there. I think uh, what's important to note is, of course, that this was sparked by this horrible tragedy of a young 22-year-old woman who was visiting Tehran from Kurdistan, Iranian Kurdistan, so the city of Saqiz, and she was um, arrested by the morality police. Um, uh, not because she was unveiled, but because she was what they say improperly veiled. So um, they, you know, they, and this is something they do regularly. They arrest people, harass them, beat them, uh, imprison them, torture them, um, send them to re education centers uh, for this improper veiling or unveiling. And um, uh, what happened um, there is that she was beaten so badly that her skull was fractured. And if you look at photos of her uh, on the hospital bed in a coma, uh, there's blood, uh, dried blood in her ear. So it's not the heart attack that the Iranian regime says. She was a healthy young woman. Um, and actually the doctors from the uh, hospital, Kasra hospital, where she was taken, when she um, collapsed at the morality center police's head, you know, offices, uh, prisons, um, they had said that she she had been beaten, uh, but again, that was censored by the Iranian government. So it's very clear that they murdered her, they killed her, and uh, they are murdering people on the streets of Iran uh, who are standing up for her. Uh, but this, the, the, you know, the murders and the attacks on women has taken uh, been taking place for over forty years plus years now. What's important about this is seeing people fighting back, and I think this has been the case over many decades in Iran as well. But it's a watershed moment because one, women are leading it. Men are standing alongside women. The slogans of this, what we're calling a woman's revolution. And for many decades now, we've said that the revolution that's coming in Iran is going to be a female revolution, a woman's revolution. And I think that is unfolding before our eyes. The main slogans are, we don't want an Islamic state. We don't want um, a dictatorship. And the main slogan is women, life, freedom. I mean, it's just such a beautiful, inspiring slogan and movement with women at its forefront, the unity that we're seeing. And the protests have been taking place in over 80 cities across uh, Iran. And as you also mentioned, we had a protest in London yesterday, but there's also been mass protests like we haven't seen before, unprecedented protests, not just in Iran, but also outside of Iran. And just this outpouring of support from mainstream personalities, you know, it has really inspired uh, people everywhere. Yeah, and I think, I mean, again, it's happened at such a time where there are world leaders, obviously, which, you know, they should be doing more. The UN General Assembly is sitting at the moment. And I know there are certain Iranian activists in their respective countries who are saying our government is not doing enough. So they're trying to call on, especially here in the UK as well, we're saying call on your individual MP, make this known, go outside the Iranian embassy. Um, but just, just before we go into that as well, I wanted to unpack 
the slogans a little bit with you because I think, as you say, these are very, very poignant slogans that um, women, life and freedom, death uh, to dictatorship, death to the Iranian dictatorship. Mm -hmm. um, so, Mariam, if you could just tell us a little bit about how heavily intertwined the symbol of hijab was with the Iranian regime. For example, I was listening to a news report and they were saying that in Iran, news to me, but um, the general theory behind what the regime was doing to, is to say, if you, as you rightly mentioned, it's not even a, a veiled properly, but if you have veiled immorally, then this hijab is technically a symbol of the blood of our martyrs. So imagine that level of uh, like the onus that you're putting on a woman when you're saying, if you're covering a few strands of hair, like Masa Amini, if you're uncovering a few strands of hair, you are disrespecting the blood of the, the the martyrs of our nation. And they're trying to kind of put this all together and keep this symbol in place. And that's what women now are just absolutely fed up and sick and tired with. I mean, uh, you know, that is Islamic propaganda. The reality is that uh, the veil is a, a very much uh, an integral pillar of Islamic rule or any theocracy, you know, the control and policing of women and their bodies is integral to their rule. And because it's such a visible sign of Islamic rule, the imposition of, of that and making sure that visibly they are seen to be in control, it's always fought uh, on the bodies of women. You know? and, and this is why when you're talking about the hijab, it's not just about a piece of clothing, you know, it is, uh, and it's also uh, not just about women's bodily integrity, which of course it is, you know, women having control over what they wear um, without the states or morality police or Islamists and fundamentalists or reactionary misogynists, uh, men or women's um, impositions, but it's very much a direct challenge to Islamic rule, because if there is no hijab in Iran or improperly veiled women, it is really the beginning of the end of an Islamic regime. And I think that's why it's such a challenge and that's why they arrest and fine um, and um, intimidate and beat millions of women every year. What I want to say too is that this movement against the veil is not a new movement. Um, in 1979, after the imposition of compulsory veiling, which started first in government offices in Iran. Because as we know, in every society, the Islamists come for women first, all religious theocrats come for women first. Um, there was a mass protest in Tehran against compulsory veiling. And the slogan of the Islamists was, either you wear the veil or you get beaten. Yoru sari, yotu sari. That was their slogan. And actually, during that period, women had acid thrown in their faces. They had their veils pinned with um, pins onto their heads if they weren't doing it. And it was a bloody sort of suppression of women's demand not, uh, not to be veiled. Um, but nonetheless, since then, so for over 40 years, women have been challenging these rules in various ways. Of course, what we're seeing today in Iran is the fruition of those decades of fights uh, and a new generation that is honestly fearless, brave, courageous, inspiring. Uh, I, I think we are all in awe of them, that they um, are so um, fearless in standing up to the morality police, the regime's forces, burning their veil. And we have to remember, that this is being done at risk to their lives. Uh, you know, tens of protesters have already been killed. Uh, there's been internet blackouts. Um, they, the regime has brought its full forces um, out. And in fact, the Iranian president Raisi said uh, that they are going to deal without mercy with the protesters. But what's changed is that people are fearless because, you know, the Islamists rule with fear. We see that everywhere in all of our countries and including in the West, they rule with fear. They impose their rules with fear. They, they silence people through fear. And when you see fearlessness like that, when you see courage like we've seen 
of the women and men in Iran, that is contagious. That is contagious. And um, I think it, 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 and that's why it's so inspiring because it's contagious. It brings more courage and, and hope. I mean, people were saying, you know, this, it, it just brings hope. It brings hope that change can happen. And I think that's why it's so important for all of us um, to support this movement because it will have effects in all of our countries. You know, if you look at the last 40 plus years, with the advent of and the rise of the Islamist movement and other far right religious right movements uh, also, it happened with the suppression of the Iranian revolution and the establishment of an Islamic regime there. We know 40 plus years ago, none of our countries were as Islamic as they are today. And it's, it, it had a domino effect. So imagine the domino effect of a feminist, a secular, a yeah. modern movement in Iran the domino effect it will have in our regions and across the world. So we have to do it now because as protesters in Iran say, if we don't bring see it to fruition, uh, we're going to again the, watch mass killings. It's just going to be this continuous cycle. It has to end. Um, and this is the time to do it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And especially what you say about the revolution will be female. And to go even beyond that, like as a woman, it's so heartening for me to see, you know, even the elder women coming out on the streets and standing because mm -hmm. obviously Iran is a country anyway. I think it's something like over 60% of the population are actually under 30. Mm -hmm. So now we see this massive like schism between ruling government and the actual you know genuine population but to see elder women now actually as you said mariam this has been a long time in the making this collective anger now is 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 coming out and the older women who may once upon a time have you know kind of enforced or internally enforced or policed this even on a societal level are saying no there is no more and there is no choice element to this so that again is directly linked to you are you need to topple and dismantle a theocracy for that any concept of a choice to be implemented so i just wanted to get your um views are you seeing that obviously as i said the the population is is mostly um, under 30 as well so we see these young men who actually acknowledge the plight of their sisters and their cousins and you know their fellow colleagues and they're standing by them um they're they're showing solidarity in protest they're actually helping to safeguard them on the road so you know that the the uh, militia and stuff can't actually get them because we're seeing people just being shot left right and center for even taking part in this and we're seeing that some men are losing their sons to this and even if they weren't as driven by the hijab course in, its, in itself, which should be everyone's fight, can I just say, including Western, but even if they weren't driven by it before, they're saying, my son has lost his life. I encourage every parent to go out on the streets and protest. And now this is basically saying, calling out to action that could end your life. So as Mariam was saying, this is such a it's such a watershed high key moment for Iran because things could sway in either direction. And we know Islam, uh, sorry, Iran is a complicated place. So I've been hearing a lot of, you know, this is also a buildup of so socioeconomic woes from so long ago. And there's levels of, you know, um, nationalism and separatist movements and all of that is coming together and this cauldron is just kind of boiling. So how far can we separate the hijab and the down with the dictatorship from the rest of what's playing out? Because I because I was asking Mariam, uh, I had a detailed chat with Ayman Navabi on that as well, and he said there are multiple forces at play. So we'd be very gullible if we think yes, it it, it uh, Masa Amini's um, death ha it, it has sparked all of this, but there's so many other forces uh, at play. Even for example, even as the Kurdish separatist movement, um, uh, some other hardline religious uh, Islamist people, they, they've also stood by Masa Yamini's death or they could be using it. So how do we know that this is not going to be hijacked or what do you think and what kind of, if, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Allah wills, um, if we can get rid of it, the, the, there is a revolution, it won't be hijacked. It won't be another form of Muslim Brotherhood, some other Islamist movement. Well, look, I mean, just on, on a couple of points. One is that, um, you know, I'm 56 years old, so it's not a question of, it's only young people, um, as you said, you're seeing all sorts of generations out on the streets. And I think that, uh, again, uh, Iran is in a way a special situation because um, it's a revolutionary project that was 
cut short by the Islamist movement. And so you have a population that is, yes, yeah, 70% under 30, and also uh, that is a very politicized population because of that revolutionary project that had been um, cut short. And so therefore that struggle uh, for uh, women's rights and liberation is something that we've seen over several generations. And now we've reached a generation uh, that is uh, fearless and that we're watching now uh, standing um, you know, fearlessly on, on the streets. Um, I think, um, again, also, of course, there are lots of political um, groups and positions uh, at play. For sure, there is. In every society, no society is homogenous. Uh, there are um, various um, actors in every situation. But I think what is clear now is that we have a situation where people are united against the Islamic regime and they are united behind feminist, modern, secular slogans. And I think that is hugely key. The protests from Kurdistan to Tehran, from north to south, east and west, in over 80 cities um, since we last, I last counted, um, are united across class, across ethnicity, across gender, across age. And th this is a very key moment now, what's going to happen next? There are no guarantees, of course. There are no guarantees in, and we know that very well, in the struggle for change, uh, for uh, human dignity, for women's rights, for equality. Um, there are no guarantees. Um, as we know, the Iranian revolution was a revolution for equality, for an end to the Shah's dictatorship it ended into an Islamic regime because for various reasons, because US foreign policy at the time preferred an Islamic state, given the fact that it was during the Cold War and they were building a green Islamic belt around the Soviet Union at the time, uh, to the fact that they preferred um, the Islamist movement to the left-leaning uh, revolution that had taken place in Iran. There are lots of various factors for that. Um, so, of course, um, there are no guarantees, but I think the point is not so much for us to say, um, to even scaremonger about the future. The point is, where do we stand today? And I think that is key. Where do we stand today in this fight that we see before us? How, however much the complexities are, there is this movement that is unprecedented, not just in Iran, but in the world. I think we have one other feminist um, um, society that is Rojava in the middle of war in Syria. Again, uh, thanks to, um, you know, the Kurdish women's uprising there and uh, the fight that they've done. So the fact that it starts in Kurdistan is key too because of that revolutionary background of the people of Kurdistan. And of course, there are, you know, egalitarians in Kurdistan and far-right nationalists in Kurdistan, as there are in Tehran, as there are in Pakistan, as there are in Britain. Um, but I suppose the point is, where do we stand and what role do we play in defending that progressive, you know, egalitarian movement? And that is key, I think. So um, pushing that forward, showing our solidarity, organizing around it and making sure that that voice is always heard and always at center stage. I think that's the task of all of us. Um, today. On the question of, sorry, I just also want to add on the question uh, that Nuria mentioned about uh, the role that governments are playing. Now, as you said, you know, we've got, we had Raisi, the president of Iran, who is actually wanted for war crimes and crimes against humanity, because he was on the death commission in the 80s, when political prisoners were killed en masse. So like 5,000 people were killed in one summer. In trial executions, they were asked, do you believe in God? If they said no, they were executed. Do you pray? If they said no, they were sent to execution. There are, you know, this that is that generation from the 80s that was also anti-veil and was fighting for these things. So here, here he's given the red carpet treatment. He's been allowed to speak at the United Nations. He's been given a visa by the United States. Um, one of the shockers, for example, that are used on protesters, uh, it was made in the UK. You know, So here we have this link of governments and 
whether it's direct support or silence uh, on what's happening. I mean, the UK government's foreign office has given a statement. All they've said is that they're concerned about what they've reportedly heard and that they want the Iranian government to investigate. How can you ask the regime that's murdered Mahsa and many others to investigate their own exactly. killing? Exactly. Absurd. Absurd. So, you know, I think uh, just to end is that the point is that I don't think we can rely much on governments. We don't want actually their interventions. It always ends in, you know, disaster. But I think we could f demand that governments stop supporting and stop relations with the Iranian regime and let the Iranian people do what they need to do in overthrowing this government. And Marie, wanted, was there anything? Yeah, go on, Har, sorry. I, I wanted to ask you, uh, I, I saw you, you mentioned that um, a lot of other people are talking about it too. Uh, Richard Branson spoke about it. Um, how, how important is the global um, support from celebrities and other people? Uh, for example, Christiana Amanpour, I know for a different reason though, but she uh, was going through interview uh, Raisi, but he apparently said that you need to put a veil on or hijab on, and she said, no, that is a strong movement. But other than Christiana Manpur, and even that was circumstantial, it wasn't like a, a organized protest. How important is it that we get the get the liberal left of the world to actually come out? Because I'm, I'm still seeing that, that there's a lot of support. DW has covered it, but still not the way it is when it comes for protecting um, uh, the the right to wear hijab, which is again, we I mean, I'm okay with that. Whatever people want to wear, but uh, how important is this global support of other people? Yeah, I mean, I think I I think it's it's hugely important. Look, if we look historically as well, uh, for example, the racial apartheid regime of South Africa, uh, they fought for decades against that regime, but it's when international solidarity forced Western governments to stop collaborating with the South African apartheid regime and to disinvest, for example, companies to disinvest, that they managed to win their fight. It's It, it has to be uh, both internal and external. It has to be because, first of all, we're, very, we're a global village now, aren't we? The, uh, what we do, uh, what someone does in Iran impacts us here. What we do here impacts people in Iran and Pakistan and Afghanistan and elsewhere as well. If the Islamist movement is strong in Iran, it's strong here uh, and vice versa. Do you know what I mean? So um, it, it, it's hugely important. One, because obviously, you know how much courage and strength it gives people to see that they are being supported by singers and um, uh, personalities and activists and not just other Iranians. It, you know, you feel like you're not alone. You feel like the world is listening to you for a change. And that gives so much moral support. The other thing is that when there is so much attention, it's not as easy for the Iranian regime to murder people without the world's attention, uh, you know, on it. Uh, you know, in uh, the November uh, 2019 protest, they shut the internet for three days and killed 1,500 people. They cannot do the same again. One, because of course people are fighting back in a way they never have before, but also because the world is watching. And even the most dictatorial regimes want to um, portray themselves as um, not dictatorial, you know. So the Iranian regime has gone to great lengths to say that Massa just collapsed, it had nothing to do with us. They're killing people to show that Massa's death had nothing to do with them, uh, which is ironic, you know. But the fact of the matter is that it is important. And, and I think it, it's immense. Look, um, Christian Amanpour has interviewed heads of Iranian regime with her veil on. She has. So the fact that she didn't this time is because of those women and men in Iran. And that's key. You know, it has, and I, as I said, what they're doing there is affecting everyone. There are so many people who have been silent who are now speaking up. And I think we have to take uh, this situation and continue to push forward this idea that theocracy in the 21st century is intolerable, it's unimaginable, it is such a violation of 
the rights and dignity of 21st century citizens. And I think what Massa Amini's, you know, assassination really did is to bring to light how unjust these laws are um, and how, um, you know, important it is to say something. And people are saying something now. So um, I think it's great, but a lot more needs to be done. And we, we have to keep fighting and pushing for change that is so needed. Yeah, I think this was definitely like that spark that ignited that fire and it gives a whole new dimension to what started off in Iran, even with the White Wednesday protests, things like my camera is my weapon. Because as you said, in a global village now with a population so young, they all are astute, they know how to use technology. We mm. get tweets saying, if you don't hear from us in this much time, you know exactly what's happened. So mm. just to um, wrap up on this and thank you so much, Mariam, because that was so uh, I got a couple more questions. Oh, I got a okay, couple, okay. couple more questions. Okay. Okay, so just yeah. on this point, though, what could you encourage um, just to ensure that this does not fall on deaf ears and these aren't just, you know, mm. um, like secluded protests that even we do here in the West <laughs> and then it just kind of the news cycle moves on. What can we as people do to also amplify and make sure those voices are not falling on deaf ears, even if it's something so minute that's, you know, with the phone in our hand or a call to our local mm. anything? What do you recommend we do? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think um, coming to protests is important. There were so many non-Iranians at the protests yesterday in London. And it was amazing to see uh, women who were not even, they didn't even speak Farsi, shouting Azadi, Azadi, which means freedom, and saying, say her name, say her name, Mahsa Amini, and just actually, uh, you know, being one of the, uh, the, the people who were leading slogans, and they were not Iranians, you know, so... I think that's hugely important. There are so many protests now uh, that it is very possible to do that in many cities across um, uh, the West and, and elsewhere in Turkey, in Tunisia. The Tunisian Atheists and Free Thinkers Group organized a protest in front of the Iranian embassy. Um, you know, in Turkey, even though uh, it's quite difficult and there's uh, a lot of violence from Turkish police as well. Uh, women and men have organized protests there. So I think that's something that's very key. Also, putting pressure on government officials, as you say, writing letters to your MP, calling them, uh, uh, you know, telling them to stop supporting the Iranian government, to put pressure. It's not about investigation. That's not enough. We don't want investigations. They've been killing people for over 40 years. We want them to stop having relations with this regime. We want to politically boycott this regime. Uh, you know, and that will allow people in Iran the chance to do what needs to be done without all the support that this regime continues to receive. Um, and of course, burn veils, uh, remove your veil. If you, you know, uh, all this, all these protests for hijab day and women donning hijabs in support of uh, women who wear the hijab, you know, honestly, that's a bogus movement. Of course, people have a right to wear the hijab if they want. But at a time of a rising Islamic fundamentalism, where women are killed and beaten and tortured for not wearing the hijab, where the hijab is used as a tool from Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia to silence and erase women, hijab day is a service to the Islamist movement. It is not a service to women's rights. Uh, I'd like to see some of those women remove their hijabs in defense of, uh, of women in Iran. Of course, we'll never see that because their movement is not about women's rights. It's about def defending the hijab. It's about defending Islam in power. It has nothing to do with women's rights and equality. But all those Western women, the Western politicians who go to Iran wearing the hijab while women are being killed for not wearing it, all those media personalities who wear the hijab to interview criminals who should be in jail and not running gov the government of Iran. We are asking them, remove that veil, refuse to wear the veil, come and burn a veil at our rallies or, you know, in public spaces and defend women's rights and equality. Today, if you want to defend women's rights and equality in the face of Islamic funda fundamentalism, it is by standing against the veil. That's not to say that you have to discriminate against women who are veiled. Never, don't you dare touch a woman who's veiled. Don't you dare touch a woman who's veiled. But if you want to stand for women's rights, 
you have to stand against the veil. You have to stand against compulsory veiling. And you have to uh, stand for women today who are leading that fight. And that is the brave women and men in Iran. Wow. Um, I was that gonna was ask powerful you, stuff. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you, you, you said that it, it is heartening to see how these people are coming out. And it, but to me, like, I mean, it's so brave. Um, uh, and you said that why we need more more Western voices, powerful voices mm -hmm. to speak mm -hmm. up on this issue, because last time it happened in 2019, they killed 1,500 people. Now we're seeing the same thing. The internet uh, has been shut down, and this is why mm -hmm. a lot of people are bringing in Elon Musk with his Starlink in as well, because, hey, mm -hmm. you should bring it up. Uh, I just wanted to bring that, uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Because now you, you've highlighted that this is uh, uh, straight out of Iran's playbook. Now, do you think that they're going to double down on the protesters because there are a lot of statements coming out that we're going to uh, crush this uh, rebellion or this unrest or whatever that is? They've arrested the the female activist. Um, uh, so I, I don't know if it's female or not, but Majid Tawakoli, an activist who has been repeatedly in prison in Iran in recent years, um, uh, has been, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the woman who broke this news mm -hmm. of uh, Masa Amini has been arrested as well. Her, her mm -hmm. Twitter account has been deleted. Uh, do you do you fear that there would be, um, uh, you know, Iran would be doubling down on these protesters, uh, sending in the mm. army? Because right now we're seeing these these footages coming in, uh, where these protesters going out and they're actually confronting these this morality police and and taking them head on. I mean, for sure, Iran is going to try and use all of its force, um, as it always has, you know, because it rules with suppression and killing and murder. It doesn't rule in any other way. And that's the only way it can maintain its power. But, you know, the tide has turned against it. And I think, uh, you know, uh, there's um, uh, young people, for example, putting on social media the fact that they've got a call from, you know, the security police saying we're going to come and arrest you to your house and you hear the young man saying you know I'm going to be on the streets here and there at this time why don't you come and meet me there they know you know they know this person's name they know where he or she lives and this is the response they're giving the security and also not only that they're um, putting this information out on social media for everybody to see you have people who you know Masa Amini's parents at her burial, on her gravestone, it says, uh, our dear Gina, her name is Gina, but you know, in Iran, Kurdish names are banned, and therefore her Persian name is Masa. Uh, dear Gina, uh, your name, you will not die because your name will become a symbol. And that's it. This is parents who are grieving and mourning the death of their daughter, you know, and this is what they write on her gravestone. So. Uh, you know, this is the reality that we're faced with today. Um, this is a population that is no longer afraid. And I think when you are no longer afraid, um, mm. they, that is the beginning of their end, because that is all they have, the fear that they impose. And so I think we have to show some of that fearlessness and some of that courage, um, especially because we're not living in theocracies, many of us who are living in the West. Um, we have a responsibility to be their voice, to extend their voice, and to ex and to defend this movement that is a universal movement. That slogan, women, life, freedom, is a universal struggle. We all feel it, you know, especially those of us who are ex-Muslim, those of us who are apostates, we feel that slogan at our very core because it represents everything that we have been fighting for, the right to live without fear the right to be free, to think as we choose, and particularly the right as women not to be controlled and policed and suppressed, um, you know, and to live the life that we want. So this is a universal battle cry, and that's why it has inspired so many. Uh, but we need to, we need all to, to link our hands. You know, it's, it's a moment in history where, uh, as I said, no battle is guaranteed. Are we going to be on the side to push it to win or are, are we going to sit back and watch and keep saying well they're killing people they're killing people every day they have killed people for 40 plus years you know but the difference is those people there are fighting and standing up against them and we need to be there with them i think it's significant that um 
Masa Amini's father refused to let them do the Islamic okay. prayer yeah. over her. Yeah, exactly. And he essentially said, this regime is what took my daughter away and you have the audacity to try well, and... He said, and, he said this is uh, your, your Islam. Yeah, 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 but no, but it's something even more powerful to that effect. Mm -hmm. He said, your Islam killed it and now you want to do Islamic funeral. Yeah, exactly. So to that effect, I mean, you can see like there's a this is a massive problem now. And as Mariam was saying, like this is whether you're a celebrity or whether you're just, you know, a regular person like what well, well, me, I'm not going to say Mariam's a regular person or even Harris, they're much bigger activists than me. But knowing that I have this powerful tool right in front of me that can enact to be even the tiniest iota part of this movement to make sure that one girl from that village in Iran's voice is not being silenced because her regime is just turning all connection off to the world. We are beyond that. We 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 stand with our sisters there. If she can't get in touch and tell the Western world or the UN what's happening, we will. We will be their voices when they don't have one. So I think it's really important to get these get these issues to your MP. Get these uh, get the Iranian um, war crimes. Get Masamini's death. Get these things tabled at Parliament. Get them to really consider their relationships with Iran. Do whatever you can in your own small way. But as Mariam said, like. The, this whole movement now is to make sure, and it's every individual one of our duties to ensure that Masa Amini's death is not in vain. Um, the fact that she couldn't even use her and, and even her real name has not gone out there to the world that makes that already makes me feel like she was even very much from her in that way. So Iran has, put, but this, as Mariam said, the fight starts with where we are right now, and right now we're at a tipping point. Doing your little weight against the hijab being forced on these women as an inherent pillar of that regime we have to do our bit all right well um mariam thank you very much for you're, you're on mute thank you very much for coming in and enlightening us with all this um obviously um uh, you know we're thinking of you all the time uh, i i'm obviously following retweet tweeting your tweets and keeping uh, ourselves up to date with uh, whatever you uh, bring to our information um and uh yeah i'm um, best of luck and i i'm i'm really gearing for you know the this uh, end of end to this islamic terrorist islamic republic of iran thank you to both of you uh for having me and just uh, long live the women's revolution in iran it's coming and um we all can play an important role um so just thanks again and hopefully you keep revolution. covering Yes, yeah, definitely. No, I was going to say, and we, we will keep in touch and we can keep an eye on yeah. what's happening in Iran because, Perfect. as I said, this cannot be uh, like just put into a new cycle and forgotten about. So, yeah, but thank you so much for everything you're doing so far. Yeah, let's keep fighting. Thank Bye, you. Thank you. Bye. 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 All right, guys. So that was uh, Maria Damazi. And uh, obviously, as she 